Allison is CyberSafe CMO, and she's been there with them for the last seven or so years and has been part of that success over there. So, again, thank you both for being with us, and please take it over. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to speak to you today. I'm super excited to be joined by Patrick, our co-founder and chief product officer. He's really the brain in the jar here over at CyberSaint. We've been building... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, we've been building for the last seven years or so um, a platform to help organizations manage cyber risk. And we've used AI in various different applications across the board for the last seven years. And Patrick really is the one, you know, innovating around this. And so I'm excited to speak with him and have this discussion today. So with that, um, Patrick, do you want to share your screen? Yep, I'm working on that. Just give me a second here. Cool. And thanks to everybody for putting on this event. This is really awesome. I'm gonna head, I'm actually Miami based, so I'm gonna head over there after after we have this uh, session here. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Awesome. Great. So I think we're all aware um, that inside and outside the cyber world, AI is all the rage right now. It seems like every startup, every company is claiming to be an AI company. And when I talk to chief information security officer, friends of mine, one point comes up time and time again, and that is that AI for the sake of AI does not help us much unless it's grounded in practical use cases. Um, you know, Patrick has been on the forefront of this for many years, looking at how AI can help solve classical problems in cyber risk management. And today we're going to dive into four practical use cases that are not theoretical, but these are actually ways that our customers today, that enterprises that we talk to on the cutting edge of cyber risk management are using AI whether it be natural language processing or gen AI to help solve problems at their companies. So I want to go to the next slide. So with that, I'll pass it to Patrick and he'll talk a little bit about the state of AI and cyber from a risk management perspective, and then some of the opportunities for advan advancement before we get into the agenda here. Yeah, so again, thanks everyone for having me. Really excited to discuss this. Uh, as Allison has indicated, you know, our, our approach generally has been to uh, limit AI to the applications where it, where it really is appropriate. Uh, my background goes back 20 plus years in, in AI. And really back then it was, you know, we just called it problem solving and, uh, you know, analysis on large databases. So, you know, when I joined the firm here, my background, uh, it was kind of a natural fit. I hadn't really looked at the problem in cyber, and there were some classical problems that are still, you know, out there in cyber that were, you know, candidates for early, you know, innovation uh, on our part. The first one was we work with a lot of security frameworks, so we work with, you know, uh, the, the the cybersecurity framework. We work with NIST 853. We work with HIPAA. We work with COVID. We work. The list goes on and on. There's 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 hundreds, if not uh, thousands, when you go international on the frameworks. Um, one of the major problems that security professionals have is working inside a certain set that might be core or native to their company, and then having to report out on another framework that a regulator might be asking them for. Uh, or, you know, a supplier or a vendor might be asking them for. Uh, the state of the industry when I kind of came in was there were some mapping uh, concerns staffed by human intelligence uh, that would relate, you know, controls across multiple frameworks. This to me seemed to be a great candidate for NLP. Uh, you could train a large model uh, and uh, get tighter mappings. Uh, in order to do that, we kind of had to break controls, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. The other areas uh, that we've been pulled into uh, that are fascinating are areas that some companies have done a very capable job um, of, of building AI with large data sets around threat hunting and behavioral analytics. Uh, we got pulled into it because there's a huge opportunity in vulnerability language uh, to be a little more predictive and to be a little more prescriptive on the mapping side and to answer a whole host of questions instead of just one question. And also to answer those questions in a context that the business can understand. Uh, there's a lot of applications out there at the moment that 
sort of have narrow uh, focus on a set of technical questions. There's some brilliant work that's been done in there, but uh, often the outputs are not consumable by the business side. So we're very interested in, in maybe a world model uh, that rationalizes risk uh, on, on large data sets and telemetry. So that's the broad approach. And, and the four use cases we have, we'll touch on all of those. Cool. And on the next slide, we'll jump into the agenda that covers those four use cases. Or we're going to get right into use case number one, even better. So first use case we're going to cover is leveraging NLP for regulatory compliance. So uh, organizations are struggling to effectively comply with frameworks and standards. Um, those are sets of controls or requirements. And a lot of the times these frameworks say the same thing. They just say them in different ways. Um, so there's an immense amount of wasted time and resource put into compliance due to requirement redundancy. And these requirements are coming from customers, the regulators, you know, business leadership. It's coming, hitting the security program and the GRC program from a variety of angles. Um, as Patrick mentioned, there's limited cross-block data available between security frameworks. And a crosswalk, for those who may not know, is essentially a mapping or translation table um, between different frameworks. And th that helps us get insight into how those requirements relate to one another. So our solution is using NLP to identify and put to work the semantic, semantic similarities uh, between those security frameworks versus the conventional approach, which is mapping one framework directly to another. We break controls in the, to their component parts and map those component parts to each other. So what exactly does this look like? Um, Patrick, do you wanna speak a little bit more to that? Sure, yeah, and I'll just switch to this slide because this is what it looks like practically when you get it done, right? It's the ability to take a source framework here in this case, NIST 853 special publication. There's two, two revs out now, Rev 4 and Rev 5, and map it to another framework entirely. And in this case, it's the Center for Internet Security's Sys Controls uh, and Subcontrols version 8, which has 18 controls and then approximately 10 subcontrols per uh, per control. So why why do you do this? Well, you know, historically, I'll just ground it a little bit in the historical situation. Um, a lot of the large consultancies will charge a, a good deal of money to do these mappings. Um, so it's it's been a business for a long time. Uh, and then there was a concern called the UCF out of New Orleans. They moved to California. It was staffed by lawyers who would just go through vast amounts of regulatory language and, and map them to each other. The problem is that the mappings, which we call industry standard, uh, don't take into account the atomic parts of controls. So there wasn't a way to sort of break control frameworks into their component parts. So you couldn't get type mappings. You could get sort of neighborhood results, but you couldn't go from one action inside one control framework into one or more actions inside another. And that's what, you know, we 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 trained up a model to do that, a dense neural net, uh, with some different sub 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 parts to it. Uh, one was coarse, sort of to go across uh, maybe slightly different frameworks. And one was fine uh, to, to relate frameworks that have high semantic similarity. So it's broken into a few components, that model, uh, but it's very useful when we're doing mappings. Uh, you, can, you can look at it at 90% confidence, you can look at it at 95, you can look at it at 80, uh, and it's fascinating the results. Uh, we're currently building out the model as well inside of IBM, who's a partner of ours. Um, the actual data training set, you know, which I worked with, was scraped uh, from the internet, you know. So we we pulled all the security language we could find on the planet, and uh, we fed it into the model. Uh, that project is not complete uh, because new regulations come out all the time. Uh, we missed some standards. There are standards in the Middle East that are very informative. There are standards worldwide uh, as well. So some translation is is required to to update the model. Uh, but that's the basic approach, and this saves. This saves professionals vast amounts of time. So it's a really practical application of NLP. Uh, we're, we're, we're really uh, proud of it. Uh, and it's also kind of core to, to sort of the rest of the models that we'd like to build because in any generative model, you're going to have, this is sort of the inner workings of it. Uh, and, and then you're sort of turning to what can it produce aside from confidences or statistics. And what can it produce in terms of natural human language itself? So that's uh, that's our first use case.
So jumping into the second one, um, really talking about bridging the security language gap. And Patrick mentioned this earlier, but just a little anecdote. We've seen big four consulting firms charge upwards of $800,000 to a large enterprise to get some of these mapping projects done um, with months of work. So using this can be immensely helpful for organizations to streamline the process of mapping, unlock new efficiencies, um, reduce costs, and all that 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 AI you know promises. Um, but for this use case, our starting point is really going off of the specific, very specific crosswalking task that we outline in the first use case. Um, so with the right modifications, we can evolve this into a more automated, generalized mapping solution um, using knowledge of the way the world works to help solve this problem. Because we want to be as accurate as possible, the more contextualized, the better. Um, and the more automated we can get, the more valuable this is. Um, traditionally, this journey would require more of a predefined static mapping, but what we're envisioning is more of a live, adaptable mapping engine that can dynamically connect security frameworks on the fly. Patrick, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Uh, you know, the, the basic model we have in play now just infers the, the probability of re relatedness, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ensemble of dense neural networks trained on varying security language organized by the scope. Um, the, there's the coarse estimator and a fine estimator. Um, and then the combined score really takes into account both of those. Um, that general approach, I think, is very productive. And we're scaling it out now to include other kinds of security language, uh, because it turns out, you know, security runs on uh, human language as much as anything. Uh, you know, there are IDs, there are other forms of uh, data involved, but there's a lot of human language uh, in security. So we'll, we'll then talk a little bit about how we can expand the model into a more flexible uh, one that answers questions really at any stage of an information security program. And in addition, takes in uh, you know, additional data sets, such as actuarial data for, for interpolation. So we'll move on to that. Yeah, this is where we can get pretty excited. Um, obviously, Gen AI, all the rage right now, undergone a profound uh, evolution, and there's never been more attention on it. Um, just a quick Gartner stat that I thought was really compelling. By 2026, more than 80% of enterprises will have used generative AI APIs or models and or deployed Gen AI enabled applications in prod environments up from less than 5% earlier this year. So earlier in 2023, less than 5%, by 2026, more than 80%. That is a massive growth um, in terms of adoption of Gen AI. Um, I know my team uses it every day. Lots of teams use it every day. Um, very applicable. So really, we're building on this world model concepts to develop an engine that provides finer mappings and relates previously unrelated data, security data, um, to each other. And Patter can talk a little bit more about that in detail because there's so many different data types, but they, they can relate and it can be kind of like GPT for security, which is pretty cool. Right. And I just want to flash the screen up to just, you know, sort of ground us in, you know, uh, the, the broader uh, world model issue. Um, you know, the, the exciting part of this is uh, there's all <laughs> there's all manner of questions that happen in security that don't have easy answers. Uh, they just don't. So, you know, there are risk models uh, in play in security that, uh, you know, are not terribly transparent. But then you can take the approach that the risk model should be made more transparent. Uh, so when you start to look at the other data sources, and I'll just to give an example of you know how crosswalking can be more live and dynamic, we take in automated telemetry into controls. So we map, say, policy or configuration settings into controls. Uh, as you pull in that data on controls, that data can talk across other standards or frameworks. Um, you know, imagine a scenario in which uh, you know a, a team was able to ask. Given our current posture, how would we look on this standard, a standard they don't even use? They, they could have, uh, you know, a relatively quick and accurate answer on something like that, which would be highly valuable, valuable as a query, you know, just asking that question. Uh, then there's all manner of other uh, problems in cyber, like vulnerability theory. There's 220,000, approximately 220,000 vulnerabilities out there, uh, 160,000 are fully classified. 
So that leaves about 60,000 that are floating out there that don't have a mapping into something called the common weakness enumeration. Uh, a lot of our research and other academic research has indicated that you can pretty accurately map unclassified vulns into the weakness enumeration. Now, if you can get them into the weakness enumeration, uh, and that's a language problem because vulnerability language is, you know, it tends to come out with things like cross-site scripting, you know, uh, you know, SQL injection, um, you know, uh, race condition, things like that, um, and, and that, that would map it to the weaknesses that are already known by research bodies like MITRE. So if you had a way to sort of classify the unclassified uh, and advance the, uh, the, into the CWE, you then get all sorts of other things. You get the mappings into controls because the CWE has a mapping into controls. You can train on that language as well. So you can train from the weakness enumeration into the control language. Uh, if you can get into the control language, you can begin to relate the organizational posture to broader questions with respect to risk. Uh, you can start to feed it threat-based information. So exploit information, you can then teach it, you know, to uh, look at that information across sectors. Uh, so now you can see that more and more data is coming in. And as you train the model, it, it gets stronger with respect to prediction. And now you can enter in at any point. You're not just talking about, uh, you know, some kind of endpoint product that you can ask it brilliant questions about your attack surface and the answers come out in technical jargon that you can't share with business leaders. If the future of this is that you can actually get generative answers that are rationalized in terms of the business. Uh, if you augment with additional financial data and, and you train on financial data, you can actually get answers that make sense to the business. And those answers can, those questions can be just really theoretical too. What, you know, what is the average baseline of a company, a competitor in my market with respect to their attack surface? How complex is their attack surface? Um, you know, what would be the most optimal path for remediation on the current, you know, uh, plague of ransomware attacks? Uh, all sorts of substantive answers can come out of a world model like this. So it's very, very exciting. These, these, these are sort of not connected up well enough. And I do believe that the sort of approach we've taken with respect to AI is a way to break down some of the silos and get translation across all of these wonderful research areas and actually have this come out as business readable logic. Definitely. And that tees it up perfectly for the last use case here, which is around cyber risk quantification, which for those who might not know is kind of the, the process of financializing cyber risks, right? Loss, potential loss, potential impacts from a business perspective, like Patrick was talking about. And cyber risk quantification or CRQ is a field that's rapidly evolving and demanding more innovative, more real-time solutions. The current solutions out there come from a lot of complexity um, and they typically take a long time to stand up, a ton of training to deploy um, and can be very arduous to, to implement. But they're also based on point in time data versus real-time data. And so what we've been working on is how can we make this as real-time as possible and as informed and contextualized to the business and their peer group as possible. Um, and that's really where the use of, of AI comes in here. Yeah, and this is really exciting for me because I work with so many different practices, uh, you know, and so many different practices each has its own sort of peculiar approach. Um, and, and by peculiar, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. It, it just, they are more comfortable with one model or another model. I think one of the really exciting things about uh, training models to do this is that you will have a, a kind of a buffet style available eventually. So you will have the ability to say, well, you know, this model says that, but this model says something different. This gets into the question of optimal numbers of inputs. I think, you know, back in the 90s, everyone was chasing the golden database, you know, and it was going to be the database that characterized all the buying patterns of, you know, individual consumers on the planet. Uh, it was a bit of an absurd and quixotic quest. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of wound up taking shape in, in, in some of the social media companies, and, and that's what they're chasing after. But really, they're having to solve additional problems, too. And uh, that's, you know, that's the exciting thing about this. 
if you can be transparent with respect to your risk modeling, you can actually bring up the questions that matter, you know, and the questions that matter are how much data, you know, how much data, uh, you know, how high fidelity do you go? We've seen risk models that are 30,000 lines of code. Uh, you know, we, we have then talked to practitioners that want to put, uh, you know, just massive amounts of data into models like that. Uh, that's all quite possible. Um, it would be really, really wonderful to have a state of play where we could ask any sort of question, compare dynamically any kind of risk model uh, and its answers and to see what the crossover is and understand what is the optimal amount of data. It would also answer some very long standing questions uh, that we have in the industry, which is what, you know, with respect to cyber posture externally, externally, or so those things you can know from an organization on the outside, so the security ratings companies, and with respect to internal posture, uh, wh what's the ideal mix? And what, what are the correlations between your security posture externally or internally uh, and your actual, uh, you know, breach likelihood? Uh, these are still not fully answered scientifically. So I'm very excited uh, for continued modeling uh, because I would like to know the optimal set of inputs. I know that we're chasing after uh, more and more and more. Uh, but we also have some risk models in, sim in system that are very simple, that just take in some automated data onto controls, uh, do some probabilistic things, uh, and, and then produce a risk score that changes dynamically as the control scores uh, change as well. So this, to me, uh, really represents where we're going in the future, which is to be somewhat agnostic with respect to the modeling. And, and AI is what can help us get there. Cool. So that was our fourth use case. Um, so key takeaways, you know, overall takeaway, I would say, is just AI for the sake of AI doesn't really help anyone. It has to be grounded in practical use cases. You know, these are use cases that we're talking to organizations about every single day. Um, they're real, they're tangible, and uh, it's really exciting for us to see them at work. Um, any key takeaways for you, Patrick? Yeah, I think just the the last one I made, you know, uh, trusting the output of risk models, you know, um, whether it's, you know, uh, a score or dollars or probabilities or likelihoods uh, or a heat map. Uh, we see in risk management, we see a lot of, uh, you know, sort of not knowing masquerading as skepticism. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I think a world model and generative AI can do is it, it can it can know. Uh, and it can know in a theoretical way, and it can know in a transparent way. Um, so you can tune it, uh, you can ask it all, all manner of questions, and I think uh, that will help us to socialize cyber risk management much better. So for us, it's really about transparency, which is why we don't sort of just claim we use AI, um, you know, and, and why we're not just sort of jumping on a bandwagon. We've been doing this a while, and we've been doing it with companies that also have been doing it a while. So some of the hype maybe doesn't quite have the same effect on us. Uh, but to me, uh, being able to answer complex questions in logical ways uh, that make sense for the people who are actually making decisions around security budgets, uh, that to me is really, really the exciting part of, of these applications. Awesome, any questions? Please go ahead, Lawrence. Lawrence, I'm the CTO at Miami Dade County. Hello, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, in the past, I've done cross watch with multiple uh, compliance frameworks, including uh, PCI, Stages, NIST, and several others. I'm curious how far have you guys? Uh, gotten into cross blocking, uh, let's say, X number of uh, frameworks. I know it's always been very time consuming and very tedious and difficult. So, uh, I'm wondering how far along we have Thank you. Pleasure.
Can you hear? Allison, can could you hear the question? Mm, uh, no. Was that? Oh, okay. Just the last part. I heard we heard the part about that you've had to crosswalk from a lot of different frameworks like uh, NIST and, and CGIS and others. But what was the actual end? What was the question? Uh, actual question is how many crosswalks have you been able to get into your model? Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, I would say it's in the it's in the thousands now, and yeah. there's no there's no theoretical cap. So the real trick for us has been when we first put it into production, we were doing them on demand for customers. So customers were basically, we had a large customer in the Middle East who was working with all the Saudi standards. Um, and they would just come to us with say 15 of them. And they wanted them, you know, 15, they wanted 15 to 10 and they wanted those combinatorics. So they wanted each map to each map to each map to, map to each. So we ran all those, uh, we did it. And then we did a little bit of QA and we handed it back to them. Uh, but now uh, we have it live as an endpoint, right? So we've got it live in AWS as an endpoint. So you can feed it anything. You can feed it two different uh, control frameworks and it'll come up with an output. And we're also building it out because we're partners with IBM. We're also building it out through Watson X at the moment. And it'll be the same. So, you know, it takes... Uh, it, it used to take maybe four or five minutes to turn one around. Um, and we're down to like 50 seconds, I think, on AWS at the moment. And Henry, my main, my main scientist, uh, is, is, uh, he's, he, what he really wants to have is, uh, one that can do it, you know, uh, dynamically across multiple frameworks as well. So you could sort of drop in the, the source and then light up the additional ones you wanted and it could do all of that in, in one swipe. So that's where we're headed with that. Excellent. Thanks again. Thank you all. Oh, you have another question? Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I uh, have a quick question regarding uh, when you're talking about the case study for the real-time modeling. Uh, I'm very interested in hearing the word Monte Carlo analysis. And I mm. wonder, um, is there any existing framework um, you guys are currently building upon or you just do everything from scratch? Well, with respect to Monte Carlo, we use two known uh, frameworks. You know, we use the FAIR uh, model. Uh, that's that's a t that's a simulation run of ten thousand. Um, and then we we have a model we co-developed with Booz Allen Hamilton that you know takes sort of the classical likelihood and impact uh, and calls likelihood access. So it 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 models the access by doing some threat actor profiling. Uh, and it actually uses a, a Bayesian uh, belief network as well, and then runs discrete Monte Carlo simulations at each step of the attack while modeling it. And those are thousand run simulations. Uh, you can go to the Open Fair org. They've got a lot of great uh, information. And, and anyone who really works with Fair in software has to stay consistent with, with Fair. Uh, we, we use Monte Carlo with kind of a PERT distribution in both. Um, but we can be, because we co-developed the model with Booz Allen Hamilton, we can take some liberties with it, but we wouldn't call it fair. It's just running some simulations in another model. Think like a be. hidden, uh, hidden Markov, uh, model or hidden Markov chain, um, okay. in terms of the, you know, it's a probabilistic model on uh, any way. So is it yeah. like also part of this experiment before? Part of one of our models, the, the Markov chain, basically, the Bayesian belief network. So it's really, we like it because it's independent, you know, as it moves node to node. Um, and, you know, you can fail at any point and fall out of it. So it's a good way to sort of just model a progressive staging of an attack, you know, which is common. And that has some... Um, some nice resonance with uh, some of the great research in cyber, like the MITRE attack framework, which is a sort of multi-stage approach as well, right? So you go from execute, you go from sort of initial access to persistence to execution to the actual uh, breach itself, and you can go through the TTPs any any path. And uh, you know, I think that the reason we use the BBN was because it it it's very similar to that.
Thank you. Thank you for calling in from, are you in New York today, Adric? Boston. We're in Boston. Boston. All right. Thank you for calling in. Allison, we look forward to seeing you a little later. And with that, I will introduce.